We're on the series on uh, intimacy with God, all right? You know, how do we get close to him? And we're using the Gospel of John uh, as a foundation for us to learn about intimacy with God. And today we're going to talk about money. Say to the person next to you, money. money. All right, the title of today's, uh, today's uh, sermon is Making Money is Not Bad. Okay, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, Mike, making money is not bad. And how many of you feel like saying, thank God making money is not bad? All right, that's a good thing, right? So, um, but why, why do we talk about this in the church? You know, making money is not bad. Be- um, the, the, the reason for that is because there's a lot of misconception. I think there's a lot of wrong concept of money. Now, most of us don't think about, and, but we kind of live it in our soul, in our soul, in back of our mind, and we just don't think about it. And, uh, and I just want to kind of dispel some of these, uh, these wrong philosophies of money. Now, first of all, I want to say that, now, value does not equal price. Value, say with me, value does not equal price. Now, being in a society, everything is based on money, all right? Everything is based on money. Your house has a certain price. Your car has a certain price. You go out there and get a job, there's a certain price. Every one of us, we trade our life, our time, for money. Isn't that true? Come on, think about it. Some of us have life insurance. What is life insurance? It means when you die, you get, somebody gets certain money, okay? It's almost like if, when you, once you die, that's how much your life is worth, right? <laughs> Some people are worth more dead than alive. Come on. <laughs> okay? So money, the price, does not equal to value. And many of us think like that. Well, what do I mean by that is, okay, think about it. How many of you think something is valuable because it is expensive? Think about it, right? You do that. We walk around looking at things because something is expensive. We think it has higher value. And then if you're Asian like me, okay, then I tell you, when you go shopping, you want to find the best value, right? What does the best value mean? It means that the label has the highest price tag, but it's sold at a lower price. For example, if you go look for something that says $100, but it's being sold at $50. Now, before you would not entertain buying something at $50 of that item, but because it's such a great reduction from 100 down to 50, now you gotta have to buy it now, right? Isn't that true? And, and that's how the world works. And, and they have developed marketing plans based on our value system. The way we think about value, the way we think about pricing, your price tag does not equal value, my friends. A lot of people think of, you know, because they're getting a minimum wage, they're not worth a lot. They're not being valued. You understand? Some people say, okay, because my my job, I used to get paid a lot of money. Now I don't get paid that much now. So therefore, there is a diminishing value in that person's life. Some people, once they stop working, stop making money, they feel like they're no longer contributing to the society. Therefore, they feel that they're no no longer valuable. You, You see what I'm saying? And I was sharing with this earlier in the previous service, and, and uh, I didn't tell them the, the whole story. I told them a little bit of the story, but uh, it was a friend of mine. This is a true story. A friend of mine, p- pretty successful business person, and his dad is a pastor, very successful pastor for, for a long period of time. Everybody looked up to this pastor. And once this pastor retires, okay, and I'm just telling you to let you illustrate how this even affected pastors' minds. When once this pastor retires from his, his job as a pastor, he, he felt like he has nothing to do. He has no worth. He felt like he was worthless. So, so one day, by adding more worth, his, his son, who, who has a really nice home, and then his plumbing was broken, something wrong with the toilet, okay? And so the, the dad offered to help. Now, now, before, the dad would probably say, you know, leave it to the plumbers, right? Come on. Somebody say Amen. Leave it to the plumbers, okay? But then, but because the dad felt like he needs to contribute, all right, save the son some money 
So the, the father offered to help fix the son's plumbing in the toilet, okay? And come on, it, it, do you think this pastor is an expert in fixing plumbing? Not really. Some are, but not everybody knows how to do all kinds of things, okay? So this pastor tried to fix this thing, and guess what? He made a bigger mess. <laughs> bigger mess. And it sounds funny, but it was, it was tragic in the way he described the story because he found his father, this, the son, found the father in the bathroom sitting on the floor completely broken, completely broken. And he was hitting himself on the leg and saying, I am good for nothing. I mean, such a, a, a powerful influencer of the gospel. What a great pastor. But, but he came with this kind of mindset, just like most of us. If you're not making money, you devaluate your life. Okay? And, and the truth is, come on, we all know the value of a person's life is more than money. Amen? Amen. We got to believe that. In the church, at least, come on, everybody, you can look at each other and say, you're more than money. Yeah, that's right. If any time anybody tried to put a label on you and say, you're only worth this much. Oh, you're only worth $100,000 a year. You know, you're only worth $40,000. You know, anytime anybody put a label like that, they're trying to say your, your price. They're trying to name a price for your life. But I tell you, we're more than that. Got to be more than that, right? And, and our society keep doing that to us. Don't that, look at yourself. Don't value, value yourself based on how much money you make. Stop that. Cut it out. Tell the person next to you and say, cut it out. Stop it. No more. All right? No more. See, that's how the, the, our mind is being brainwashed here. Our mind is being brainwashed in our society. All right? And that's the first point. And the second thing is that a lot of people, especially Christians, okay, we think talking about money is unspiritual. Come on. Isn't that true? Every time in church you don't want to talk about money because you think money, talking about money is so vain, it's so, un, so unspiritual. And, and then it's so, such a worldly thing, nobody should be talking about that, especially on the pulpit. Isn't that true? But you know, if you, if you look at the life of Jesus, if you combine all that he talked about, about heaven and hell, it did not surpass, it would not surpass the number of times that Jesus talked about money, about finance. Jesus spoke a lot about money. In fact, all his parables combined, like I think 37 or 39 of them, uh, one third, almost a third of his parables has something to do with money. You're right. How did you know? Okay, she went to the last service, and I used the same <laughs> illustration. <laughs> okay, Jesus talked a lot about money because money matters really gets to the root of our hearts. And some people say money is the root of all is that true? Is that from the Bible? Is that from the Bible? I can tell you it's not from the Bible. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. People like to blame things. You know, the problem with my life is because there's money. No, I can tell you it has nothing to do with money. Nothing to do with money. The love of money, having money ruling over your life, having money define who you are, that can kill you. That can kill you, all right? So, uh, <laughs> now some people believe that money can, with money you can do anything. Isn't that true? Some people, you know, th th isn't that true also even in the church? People think that, oh, just because we have more money we can do more things. Yeah, that's true. That's how we think. And a lot of times in our, in our board meetings, a lot of times in our meetings, for, and we, we talk a lot about money. You say, oh, if we had this much money, if we had this, if we had that. But what if we don't have any faith? All we have is money. That'd be awful. See, today we need to learn to walk in faith. Okay? Not Look at the greens. Now look at how much money you have making decisions based on how much we have. Come on. Somebody say amen. Now, of course, we need to be good stewards. We need to be accountable, of course. We're not going to be here say talk about ridiculous things, okay? We're here being very practical as well as Christians. But when we make a decision about the church of God, about our lives, 
We base on the faith that God placed in our hearts. Okay? Don't be limited by the money you have. Or don't let money become the ultimate kind of solution to our problems, ultimate dictator to everything we do. Stop that. As a Christian, we need to go beyond money. All right, we need to know what money is really here for. And so, so that's why we talk about this topic, and, and, and I think it's because also the Bible touch, it, touch on it, and it's found in chapter 2 of John, verse 12 through 25. And let's look at that briefly, okay? We're not going to spend too much time on this passage. We're just going to uh, find, the, find the nuggets from the Word and, uh, and go from there, all right? So let's read verse 12 to 13. You see it on the screen up there. And uh, we, can we all read it together? After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Pause right there for a second, okay? I want to talk about the Passover. The Passover is such a ridiculously big holiday for the Jewish people. It's huge. Now, what's the biggest holiday here in America? Christmas. Christmas, of course. Christmas is still the biggest holiday. Now, what's next to Christmas in terms of second, ho ho second biggest holiday? Halloween. Halloween okay? So, <laughs> used to be Thanksgiving, but now people skip through Thanksgiving. They go to Halloween now. Halloween becomes a bigger thing because as a, it, it's what, what we value, the, the size of a, the, the value of a holiday based on how much money people spend. Okay, people spend a lot of money in Halloween now, uh, more than they spend money in Thanksgiving. Isn't that crazy? So it's like Christmas to Americans, okay? Jewish Passover is for Israelites. It's such a big deal. Now, why do they go to Passover? They celebrate Passover. It was because the, they remember the time of Moses, okay? When, when God saved all the Israelites, and, and it was through this miracle they called the Passover, and, and uh, it was a great thing. A lot of lives, uh, millions of lives were saved, okay? And so anyways, um, they, every year during Passover, all the Israelites, no matter where you live, will make a journey to the temple and make an offering to the Lord. Now that, that is, I, I call that very devout, Okay, that, that is religious. If anybody can talk about being religious, I mean, some of, you know, we go to church every week, right? Every week we go to church, people go to church and then worship God. These guys, they travel miles upon miles on a donkey or on a horse for days and weeks just to get to the temple. Isn't that crazy? Think about that, and some people complain about driving to church for an hour. <laughs> now, I'm not here to criticize because there's a lot of different churches we can go to, right? But, but uh, I, I think that the Jews, um, they, they have this heart that, that just we can learn from. They, they have such commitment to their faith that they would go make this journey to, to uh, make a sacrifice to the Lord once a year. It's, it's amazing. And during that time, the temple was such a... So the, you know, the largest ever been, okay? Bigger than King Herod's temple. This is, uh, okay, bigger than King Solomon's temple. This is King Herod's temple. King Herod built this temple. It's a huge, humongous thing, okay? And then they, they have outside, there's an outside court and an inner court. And the outside court, there's a court of the Gentiles where, where uh, just non-Israelites, non -Israelites, non Jews can enter into the court of Gentiles. And this is what's taking place here in the story. So this is the background. Just going to give you guys a little bit of background. All right, so let's look at verse 14, 15, and 16 real quick. Okay, let's read it together. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all the, from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He's got the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Pause right there. Pause right there. For those of you who's never read this passage before, who's never spent time investigating what took place in this story, okay, what is your first reaction? Come on, what is your first reaction? Anybody? What is it? Anger. anger. Your anger or Jesus' anger? 
Both? Okay. Go, okay, so, so what's going on here? Now, some people look at this passage, their immediate reaction is that, what's up with Jesus? Why is he so angry? Why is he so angry? Why is he so violent? Anybody re react this way? You know, because Jesus was supposed to be kind, right? Right, but you know the story. That's why, right? So Jesus is angry. <laughs> and you're saying, okay, people are being ripped off. That's why Jesus is angry. But, but I mean, if you didn't know that, you look at Jesus and, okay, this is a normal operation here. Okay? It's a daily routine here. It's a marketplace. And Jesus went there and, and he made a whip. Whip! I don't know who, who got caught of the end of that whip. I don't know. <laughs> People must be scared, okay? Everybody jumping inside. Whoa, Jesus, are you okay? What's up? And then all the disciples look at Jesus. Jesus, calm down. Please, calm down. Okay, what happened? So did he have a bad breakfast or something? You know, some, I don't know, right? So this is out of character for Jesus because most of us imagine Jesus to be what? God, yeah, gentle, and, and he is he's very composed. He doesn't lose it every now and then. He doesn't, so every now and then, I hate this, and he starts throwing this. He doesn't do that. He's not in the kitchen throwing plates around or knives, you know. He doesn't do that. But, but he, this, this is kind of weird, a disciple seeing Jesus standing in the temple, driving out people who's doing normal business. And when I say normal business, let me kind of give you a little background, too. I mean, in the, in the temple, we, we have money changers. We have people selling cattle, sheep, and doves. Why, why are these people there? You might ask. Well, first of all, if they're there, they must be there because they're supposed to be there. People suppose, you know, why? Why? Why do you think they're there? Well, the money changer is obvious because if you have all these people coming from all different regions, think about it. All different areas of Judea and, and outside of the area, people have different coinage. Does that make sense? They have different monies. Or so let's say people come in with a different coinage, come to the temple. For people to make kind of trade, you need to use the local money. Okay? So they exchange the money, all right, to help the people so that they can trade and buy things in the local city. Does that make sense? Come on, isn't that a good service for the people? You do it to help the people facilitate their business transaction. This is great stuff here, all right? So whoever came up with this idea was ingenious. It was ingenious. Whoever came up with this idea was a good guy, was a smart guy, right? And then also selling cattle, sheep, and, and dove makes sense. Why? Because if you travel for weeks, and you have to bring the best on your flock, from your flock. So you brought your cow, your cattle, whatever it is, you brought your sheep, and you, you travel for miles and miles and miles. Guess what happens in the transition? Your best cattle becomes a skinny little dying cattle. Cow, you know? What used to moo now is dead, right? Losing his life, all right? So what used to be a fat and, and perfect looking now becomes skinny little bony thing. And what you're supposed to do? Well, because these priests have to inspect all the sacrifice, all the different animals. So the, the priest look at this cow, uh, what used to be a healthy, strong cow, now a skinny. Hey, you can't give God a skinny cow, right? So they came up with a brilliant idea. So instead of them bringing all these different animals from outside the province and, and then coming into the city, to Jerusalem, why don't we have our own cattle, okay, so these high priests and these priest families, they hired shepherds and, and they raised cow and, and sheep and on the outside of the city and bring them to the city so that these people can come in and if they don't have the right ones, they can buy them. Isn't that a brilliant idea? Come on, somebody say amen. It's a great idea. It's a great idea because, because people who really have the heart to give God the best thing and they didn't bring the best thing because the best thing happened to die on the way over here. So they have to, they have to buy one. Isn't that great? So that's what happened here. It's legitimate business. Does that make sense? It's legitimate. And the high priest, everything is approved. And guess how long they've been doing that? A long time. A long time. So nobody would ever question why it's there. Okay? Nobody would question why it's there. But the problem is this, that Jesus got upset with them. Well, if you think about the context, if you understand the story a little bit, of course these people started off wanting to, you know, help the people. Somebody say amen. 
It's, it's it, this, this, whatever it is, this business or ministry, it, it's there to help people. And, and is it okay to make some money of it? Come on. Is it okay to make a little profit as you're exchanging this coin for people? You make a profit because this way you can sustain ability, right? Come on, think about it. It's reasonable to make a little bit of profit so you can keep this thing going. Because the people that are hiring, you're hiring shepherds out in the field outside the city, you need to pay the shepherd, right? Who, who's going to pay the shepherd? Well, you got to have to make some money, right? So making a little bit of profit is not a bad thing. Come on. Somebody say amen. Nobody's convinced. <laughs> making some money is okay. Tell the person next to you, it's okay. But what is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture is, is when you do something for a long period of time without investigating your heart, if you haven't spent time thinking about why you do what you do. Once you do something for a long time, you forget why you do it in the first place. It started off as something that, that serves the community at large to help the poor people that, that comes in uh, that's maybe not be fully prepared, but their heart is ready. Okay, it started off that way, but then guess what? Mike is right. <laughs> These people start ripping people off. The high priest, you know, they're supposed to look for defects on these animals. So instead of, in, instead of being honest about inspection, they look at every cattle that walk through their, their, right in front of them. They, they'll say, no, nah, this, this does not qualify. No, this is not good enough for USDA choice. You know? You see what I'm saying? They're the ones who's actually telling people their animal does not qualify. Therefore, you had to buy it from us. You had to buy it from us. If you buy it from us, then, of course, we'll, we'll make the sacrifice. Otherwise, we cannot take your sacrifice. And if we don't take your sacrifice, it means that you're not pleasing God. And then, the, you know, the money changers, of course, they're making more money now. Did you notice in the story, Jesus was yelling at one person? Who, who was it? Who was it? Look at the story. The guy who was selling dove. He skipped through the cattle and the sheep, and you went to the guy selling the little, little fluffy feathered friend. Okay? Why? Why did he yell at the, the guy who was selling dove? Because cattle and sheep is for those people who has money. Guess what? The people who buys dove are the ones who are the poor. Jesus is yelling at the guy who's selling the dove because all they care about is making money. You are even ripping off the poor. That's why he was upset. He wasn't upset just because they're making some money. He wasn't upset that they're making, just exchanging the money for, for, for their trade. He was upset because they're ripping off the poor. When you started the ministry, you started the ministry intending to serve people. But when you forget why you serve people, you forget why you even start this whole thing, even to the point you're ripping off the poor, that's when Jesus can't handle it anymore. Okay? Now, is it okay once in a while you lose it? Come on. Come on. Somebody say amen. Okay? Now, so once in a while you're going to say, I can't handle this no more. Turn to the person next to you. I can't handle this no more. Yeah, the righteous anger of God came, and he made a whip. And man, so unlike Jesus, but I can tell you that is so righteous. So righteous. Sometimes we've got to turn the table. Sometimes we need to chase people out of the church. Sometimes we need to close, sh shut down some business in the church. Sometimes we need to take that thing and turn it upside down. Somebody say Amen. Because when it's no longer glorifying God, when, it's, when there's no longer righteousness in that business, you need to shut it down. Now, how do you think other people respond? All right? How do you think people, people respond to this thing, okay? They're scared to death. <laughs> Jesus. Woo! Whoa. All right, so here you have verse 17. Let's take a look at verse 17. This is his disciples' response. Verse 17, the disciple responded by saying, verse 17, his disciple remembered, everybody together, that is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, where do you think zeal come from? 
Zeal comes from the passion in a person's heart. Have you ever encountered a situation? Have you ever been in a place your the passion in your heart consumes you? Have you ever it, it, have you had that experience where the passion inside your heart just comes out and consume you like fire? Wow, that was Jesus. And that's what we call the righteous indignation. He was righteous in his heart, and he, and he did something that most people don't expect him to do. And the mild, gentle Jesus became a wild and violent Jesus. <laughs> and that was, that was righteous. Okay, so his disciples, now they didn't get it. They didn't get it at, at that time, but they had understood it much later, of course. All right, so, my friends, why do you do what you do? Matters. Why do you do, for whom do you do these things for? Right? Why are you doing all this? Making money is great, but why are you doing it? Who are you doing it for? You got to think about that. That's what the Bible teaches us. Think about it. Don't just keep doing it in a routine like the Jews. They had this temple and they had this giant size uh, court for the Gentiles. And then, of course, make some money. And there's no problem. Serving the people, there's no problem. But why are you doing it? Got to know the zeal of God. Does it consume you? My friends, I really want to know what's consuming you today. What is consuming you today? Oh, big breakfast is consuming right now. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about my lunch later. What's gonna, what I'm going to eat for later, you know? Uh, maybe next week I'm going to get a, this big job, you know? Get some, make some money. What's consuming you? What's consuming you? What's consuming you? But I can tell you, what's consuming is really consuming you. Some people think you have things in control, but I can tell you what you think you have in control is in control of you. What you think you have is possessing you. The love of God has to be consuming your life. So, and we look at the, the response of the, the rest of these people, the Jewish people. Let's work, uh, read 18 through 22 together, okay? Let's read 18. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do with all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had he spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now think about it. This guy, without kind of a warning, okay, hey guys, look, look, I'm going to go into a temple and, and, and make, a, make a big ruckus, all right, cause a big ruckus. All right? I'm going to turn over some tables, I, I'm going to shout, and I'm going to get a whip and beat people out of there, you know. I, you know. No, no warning. No warning. He went in there and, and caused this chaos inside the temple. All right? What do you think the normal people would do? Normal people. These are the Jews. Normal people locally. Jews. Hey, who gave you the right to do that? Isn't that right? The, the, the question that they asked Jesus is very legit. Legitimate question. Who gave you the right? Who said you can do that? You're nobody. I mean, Jesus is just a traveling rabbi, rabbi from place to place preaching the good news and the, of the kingdom, right? And he all of a sudden came in without, without any special relationship, without special plaque. He doesn't have the police badge or FBI or anything like that. He didn't, he didn't come with any kind of special authority. He came in and took authority on his own and just did what he did, all right? Whew. What do you have that will give you the right to do that? That's a very legit question. So they ask him, can you perform miracles? Show us that you're signed from God. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, if you, what? If you destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. Now, the Jews were very proud of their temple. The Jews took them 46 years to build whatever that was standing there at the time. All right, 
what was standing there at the time was already 46 years and took him a few more years, a couple more years to finish up the rest of the temple. But it was a big deal for them. What you are talking about destroying this temple and then uh, he, you're going to raise it in three days. You're kidding us. We took a lot of people, thousands were involved in building the temple, and now you think that you can do this on your own? So they didn't get it. But Jesus obviously was talking about his, his own body, his body. He was going to die for us. And then three days he's going to raise from the dead. But see, so many of us are so fixated with the physical architecture. We're so fixated with things, objects. But when Jesus is talking about the spiritual reality, the spiritual reality is what he's concerned about. See, the body of Christ, the church, cannot be destroyed. Do you understand that? Churches may fall down. The crosses may be removed. Oh, I can tell you there is persecution coming. Let me warn you. There's, come, there's persecution coming here even in America. It's coming. All right? And, and why am I smiling? Because isn't that great? <laughs> Persecutions are coming. Why? Because when persecution comes, faith becomes a reality. Most people live in the luxury of provision. We have so much. When there's no persecution, we enjoy all these things as, as if as in, there's a sense of entitlement where we're supposed to have all this. And even today, as Christians, we enjoy special tax benefits when you make a tithe offering to the church. We enjoy all that. Yet, we forget what is important is the core. The core. The heart. Which is the greatest criticism that, uh, in this passage, you know? Jesus wasn't talking about making money as sin or selling cattle, sheep, or dove as a sin. No. Jesus is criticizing their hearts. He's condemning their heart. You know? So, when religion loses life, what do we have left? Nothing but rituals and traditions. If all you have is ritual and traditions, would, would the f religion save anybody? Come on, somebody say amen. If all we have is religion on the surface, there's nothing on the inside, it's just tradition and rituals. It's not gonna save nobody. So I love it when Beatrice was doing the, in the communion this morning, change it up a little bit, okay? It's cool. It's good to ch change it up a little bit and, you know, kind of remind you why we do it. Right? So Jesus went in and, and challenged the, the tradition of the religious system and, and all their ritual just so that he could get to the heart of these people. And when Jesus responded to them and said, you know what? Look at my life. Look at my sacrifice. That's what matters. Look at my life. Look at my sacrifice. Okay? What authority do I have? Look at my life. Look at my sacrifice. That's the authority. The authority of a man has to do with the relationship he has with the Father. God the Father. And that gives a person authority. And gives the right for him to walk in that situation. And then we have to look at the last part of this passage. Okay? Everybody needs time to wake up now. The last part. All right? 23 to 25. What did 23 to 25 say? Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover f festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew that what was in each person. All right? So Jesus performed more signs and wonders. And there in this passage, some people believed. In other words, some people did not believe. Some people believe, if I could see signs and wonders, if I see a miracle, I'm going to believe. Well, that's not necessarily true. And even the people who believed, Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Do you see the problem here? Do you see that? Even the people that believed in Jesus, Jesus did not entrust himself to them. Why? What's wrong with them? Just like the people in the temple. 
The problem was the heart. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. People have heart problem. Okay? So, what is the, what is the real issue here? If we look, ask the same question again. Making money. Making money. Anything wrong with that? In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, it would not sound like a very good blessing, typically. I want you to make a lot of money, guys. <laughs> As a pastor, I, I'm saying this. This may sound like a very unspiritual thing, but I, I want you all to make a, a lot of money. God bless you, everybody. Make a lot of money, all right? <laughs> make a lot of money, Neha. Get, get your job out there. Make a lot of money. But most importantly, know why you make money. Who you're making it for. See, the problem is a lot of times the church is not empowering the people with this stewardship philosophy. We're all stewards of God. Whatever resource God's given us, everything belongs to Him. So everything we do, we do it for the glory of God. And I want to bless everybody to make a lot of money. Make a lot of money for God. So we can invest back in His kingdom. Okay? Because you belong to Him. Chris, make a lot of money. Go, make a lot of money. All right? All right. Zachary, make a lot of money. All right? Yeah. Anybody? Tiffany, make a lot of money. Go, go, go. <laughs> Everybody needs to go encourage each other to make a lot of money. Why? Because you do it for the Lord. Now, if you have the gift to make money, do it. Do it for the Lord. But don't forget why you do it. The, the matter has to do with your heart. Okay? Don't, don't be looking at somebody who's rich and say they're vain on spiritual. No. What makes difference is the heart. Have you ever seen a poor person that is unspiritual? <laughs> I know a lot of poor people that's unspiritual. Okay? Uh -huh. They could be just as vain or worse than another rich person. Rich or poor doesn't make you spiritual or unspiritual. What makes you unspiritual is when your heart is not with the Lord. Amen? Praise God. So let us pray right now.